Sir, before you, you young ladies arrived, we were going through this, 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 uh, this page that has commands on it. Mika, the one that says commands. See. So I'll say it, and then just you, just people repeat it. When somebody knocks on the door, you answer Kutzla. Kutzla, Kutzla, come on, repeat it now. Kutzla, Kutzla. There you go, Kutzla, Kutzla. Can you say it? Kutzla, Kutzla. And then the next one is Kausla, 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 Kausla. Place your bum on a chair. And then this next one might be a little bit harder to say. Kaslusla. 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 Get up. No. Hmm? What can we do? It's easier for you to say this. Than it is for me to hear it. The H and the L. Oh, H L. Uh, yeah, they're they're. Uh, many of the uh, many of these indigenous languages, including the Welsh language, use those sounds, but you don't get them too often in English. My chalk. That's funny, how come they call this? Why isn't it called chalk? It's spelled T H A L K, chalk. <laughs> so we have a, a D L sound, we have an H L sound, and a T L sound. And the way that I remember it is, if you have, I'll say the word antler. Antler. Now if you change this T to a D, antler, do, antlu, antla, la, D L la. So you have the do, tu, tu. Antler. That's pretty easy to say, antler. So we just remove the other letters, so it's a teal and tu. Tu. And then this one you remove to change it to an H instead of antler. It's two, two, antler, two. An antler, and two, two, blur, two, blur, blur. So it's just little memory devices like that. Yeah, uh, that's But they are hard to hear. Because yeah. a lot of times when you see the HL this way, that, that really means that since, um, I think it's, this person, they call it with capital H L uh, refers to a person, but a small letter H is different. It's the same sound, but it's just a different way in which it's expressed. Uh, and then T uh, la, T la. Can I hear anybody else say T la, T la, T la. Tisla, and then Tisla, Tisla, Hoxta, Hoxta. When you're going to get ready to dance, Hoxta. Hurry up, let's or let's, huh? That's really hard to get 
wrap my mind around the KWF. I don't hear it. You don't hear? I don't hear uh, Well, see, I can't hear you either. Yeah. Well, see, like with the, uh, the, w, the KW, yeah. you don't pronounce the W. <coughs> it's Qua. Uh, Qua. Hakusta. Hakusta. So you mouth the W without pronouncing Hakusta. You move your lips, but you don't say anything. Hakusta. So same with how. Hakusta. 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 These are higher consonants, not English. Because they will be consonants, so that doesn't have a sound. Yes, I am trying to. See, like I said, we don't have an R sound or a V sound. So instead of saying cherries, you say chellies. And my grandmother couldn't pronounce the name Riva. She'd say Liba. And one of the old men at home, his name was Victor. So I asked him, well, what did your mother call you? And he says, Dicta. She named him Victor, but called him Dicta. And Victoria was called Maktali. Oh, Victoria, B.C. Quiet, quiet. It's just wait, wait, quiet, quiet. Quiet, 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 quiet. It's now. Actually, it's really funny when you use that word now because conceptually in in Haida, now does not exist because the moment you say now, it's gone. Everything is becoming. It's always moving. And so, when you say something, uh, when you use the word now, that means, I don't want, I don't want to have to wait until after a while. Do it right, do it, do it, just do it while I'm right here, whatever. But anyway, so that that's, one of the things you run into different languages too. Dak, dak. See, there's that KW sound. Dak, dak. So you watch, watch. Dak, dak, dak. Yeah, dak. Dak, dak, dak. Dak is the English. Dak is the. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's like I said, like the word chalk, C H A L K. And but but if you pronounce you spell it a different way, it means something different. C H A L K it's this white substance. C H O C K is something you block a wheel with. Chalk. Uh, Waji is da, is da, is da, is da, is 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 da. Waji is, Waji is da. That means you take this. H L Waji is da. I guess it was. Waji in white is da. Uh, in Y is half. Uh, 50 cents in Haida was called uh, In Y dollar. In Y dollar. And uh, since we didn't have word for R, uh, quarter was quarter. Quarter. <laughs> quarter. And uh, a long class, a long class, write it down. Thanking and response. Ho ah. Uh, it's two syllables. Ho ah. Uh. I don't hear anybody. Ho ah. Uh. Ho ah. Uh. And then the response of you from Alaska, the A. Um. 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 And from Massive, they say Anga. Anga. Whereas ours is on. The voice has to go up. Then, how are the guang? The guang. How are the guang? How are 
to Guam. So that's where you'll be speaking to some male or female younger than you. For sometimes I've heard uh, some of the young ones refer to like a grandmother like that, and the grandmother just giggled. Because <laughs> they're saying you're younger than me. And then for like the boy walking over here, to thank him for his story. Kautla is hawakuna. See? See how nice he is? Hawakuna. So that's what you say to a male that's younger than you. Hawakuna. And each time, see, hawa, like I say, it's like it's giving a gift. You're excelling, telling that person, you touch my spirit. Um, so instead of the person thanking you back, they just say, um, they accept the gift. Then compliments. When someone does something that you approve of or you're impressed by a little bit, who, 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 see the voice goes up, who, 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 and then the other person just says, Salam. Or if you tell my, like, for example, somebody would say to my dad, gee, you did a good job on that. And his response would be, I know. <laughs> Instead of just saying, yes, he'd say, I know. He, you're smart, I know. <laughs> and then when something is really something worth, something that you're really impressed with, there we go again, the underlying G. <coughs> and then when something or somebody is very beautiful, Hanesqua. Hanesqua. Hanesqua, yeah, Hanesqua. And then greetings. Sinu dum he dum. That NG sound is mmm. Mmm, like you're saying something tastes good. Mmm. Except make it an N. Mmm. Sinu dum he dum. And then the response again is D la mmm. La mmm. La mmm. Sinu das idam. And you're responding to the other person by asking, and how are you? And then if I just want to ask the crowd, well, how's everybody doing? Sinu dlam idam. Sinu dlam idam. And then these colors of the rainbow, did everybody get one of these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm wondering, uh, how many people are watching the video? Or are reviewing them? One. I, that's on the blog spot. Oh, it's on YouTube, yeah. And on the blog spot. Mm -hmm. how many, well, the YouTube videos are embedded on the blog. <coughs> If you don't find the blog, you can find it in YouTube. Yeah, see for this one here was the It's almost like you're spinning on somebody. HL. That should be a line under the G, I guess. Or black. Uh, seaweed, skew. This kind of seaweed grows for only about a month. It's black ribbons. And I think this is when we went for seaweed was when, I'll have to find out again. I thought it had to do with when the wild celery was a certain level. Either that or skunk cabbage, something like that's how they would know. But skew, 
Hugh uh, is how you pronounce that. That should be an underlined G. Hugh, Uy. Uy means the seaweed, that specific one. Hugh is just the seaweed, but Uy. Uy. And then Yalai. Well, Raven. Yal is the uh, word we Alaskan borrowed from the Dene people, Yas. Whereas our word is Hu, Huye. Huye is our raven. That's a black raven. Helgen. And then Kuntlis. Kuntlis. This is where it's sort of a yellowish green color. Uh, Skinawa, Skinawa is um, this is algae that's colored kind of green. My favorite color. Huh? That's my favorite color. That is. My eyes used to be hit all the time. Uh huh. Red. Uh huh. Huh. Um, it. It's also what we use for uh, the cat's blue. Those red chitons. In English, sometimes they call them a Chinaman slipper, Chinese slipper, yes. but they're big, kind of reddish colored skit. And that's where what we we're told is the way the, the name skittigit came from. Skit, git. Git is a child of. Because. <coughs> There's a sand spit there where they got a lot of these mm -hmm. around that area. They don't get them off the sand, but it was shallow there and sort of, they mm -hmm. said they ate lots of them. Because the people from uh, Haukan, they were called Kalai. Kalai, the bullhead eaters. Because there's a, a fish, in English it's called the Irish Lord. It's got a big head and it's got horns. They're real sharp barbs. And there's two, two varieties. One grows, oh, about this long. And it's real pretty fish, kind of a silvery and greenish color. And then there's another one, it's about this big, a big brown, ugly one. That's the one that would eat lots of those. And that comes from the time of the ice. Uh, what's now called Dixon Entrance was called Kalai uh, Kauslai. That was the bullhead spawning grounds. Uh, because when the ice came, the ocean level dropped. And so the body of water now that separates southeastern Alaska from Haida Gwaii was dry land. It was uh, tidal flats lots of tidal pools and lots of bullheads in those and so that's where people were easy to get them when the tide was out so they could actually walk across there at that time so when the ocean came back it was still called Kalai Kauslai Kal is that uh, bullhead Kalai Kauslai and then the word for uh, how can is really how how is a bay and can is a Pacific cod. They're only about this big. So it was a big long bay during the time of the ice and there was lots of these small fish in there and then when the ocean level came up uh, what used to be dry land are now a couple of islands so there's a channel through there. And so it's no longer uh, cod bay. <laughs> <laughs> And then Kuntlis uh, <coughs> is uh, yellow. There's a flower that grows on a the beach. There, there's usually a big bunch of them. They grow close to the ground. And Chuck Natron told me the name for it, but it translates to messy yellow things. <laughs> <laughs> And white. The 
the yellow flowers grow on rocks or on sand? It grows up on the sand, about the, about the high water mark is where they grow. And um, when we did the movie White Fang 2, it didn't make sense why they called somebody a white tooth. Because, you know, Fang is a tooth. So they couldn't call it Tsum uh, Ada, you know, white white tooth. <laughs> so they call it Hoots Ada, which is white wolf. And so that's what in Haida, when in the movie, you hear him calling it white wolf, Hoots Ada. But that Ada is almost like the word for father, Ada. Yeah. That's what my uh, older stepdad used to call my stepdad. Yeah. Uh, that was his he was, that was his first word he ever spoke. Yeah. yeah, the, uh, what the heck? My dad's brother-in-law, they called him Bald Eagle. Because <laughs> he didn't have any hair. The eagle without feathers. <laughs> Well, let's see. My real mission in life isn't so much teaching anybody to speak the language. What I'm really after is for people to understand the concepts in the language in our relationship to the land and to each other. Uh, you had a uh, prophecy where the uh, earth would shake and split open. You told one that that would happen sometime in your time of change in Ontario. Well, there's one that I heard from down in the south. They talk about there's a place uh, called Kerrville uh, by San Antonio, Texas. And they said, you draw a line from there right up to the bottom of the Great Lakes, like one of the low, one of the lakes that just takes the lowest, and then take that line all the way up to the St. Lawrence River, to the mouth of it around there. It says that's going to open up, and that's going to be ocean through there, and all the water in the Great Lakes will spill into the ocean. Um, but anyway, it's talking about all this change. And so what we have to do is to start preparing ourselves for change. But instead, we're going the other way. I was going to put a uh, part of a study that was published about children, uh, what's happening to children because they're no longer physically active. Many of them, and the parents aren't either. If you go back to the time of the ancient Greeks, they are the ones who start physical fitness programs. They had so many slaves that they didn't do any work at all. They even had slaves for soldiers. And uh, they realized they were getting very, very weak. So that's when they started doing physical fitness programs. And so now we're having the same same phenomenon, but it's because of those screens. <clears throat> it's very bad for people's health just to sit sedentary. I kind of wonder when I see kids sitting all day long, when they get to be my age, are they going to be able to do the things I'm doing? You know, physically being able to do that. Because if you don't train your muscles as you're growing up, they don't have any muscle memory. I took my daughter to go and uh, walk around the golf course. Mm -hmm. I took my daughter to walk around the golf course. Mm -hmm. It's about an hour walk. And she was already kind of uh, tired after half an hour. It's like, you lose your Where's my rest? And she you got to get up more. You, know, you can't sit in front of that computer all day or you're, you're mm -hmm. kind of weak. So it's a good part of uh, getting rid of you know, healthy mental illness, right, is exercise. See, what, what these guys are doing is with their dance and their songs, they're getting a lot of uh, extra 
lung power from, you have to learn to breathe deeper and have to control the flow of air, but also your muscles. Mm -hmm. So that is really what's very important because as you get, take in more air, you get more oxygen into your brain. And so when you're singing too, you're changing how you're thinking. It's, it's really making everything work. And so that's an outstanding physical fitness program. Uh, when I moved here in 2002, I was, I thought I was in shape because I was young, but all these hills here in Vancouver, I thought you need a tow rope on this hill, especially the one at Adamac where it's real steep. Pushing a stroller up those hills, like, now I don't even realize it. Now I'm just cruising along, but anyone comes to the prairies, they get here, they get their asses whooped. <laughs> well, it's like when we're at the meeting on Friday, was it Friday? And then the two of you took off from there and walked over here. I asked Todd, are they going to walk all the way over there? <laughs> walk all the way. <laughs> two, three blocks. <laughs> <laughs> My wife used to walk a long way. So we lived on Second and Crutch. And she said she was going to go take a look at some, uh, some beads or stones, something like that. And then the next day she asked if I would take her to this shop because she was kind of busy that day. So I took her there. And here she had walked the day before from 2nd and Crutch out to 29th and Main. Whoa. <laughs> That's been a nice walk. But it's all downhill for her, right? So it's probably... Well, you got to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, part of it's going uphill to get... It's very uh, steep over there. And so, another example, uh, so. went up uh, yellow cedar bark harvesting with a high fly, cherry gig, crystal, Nine Morgan, and then a whole bunch of teenagers, like her kids and uh, a couple other teenagers came along because they figured they'd be physically fit, they could help them get the bark, right? Um, I ended up getting all the bark because they couldn't climb the trees. <laughs> didn't know anything about parkour or gymnastics or jumping from one tree or they were, they were afraid. <laughs> Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy and I think you can run up and down the hill faster than you. With, with that, you know, you guys got to get going. <laughs> See, when I was 17, I started school at the University of Washington. Uh, I turned 18 that year, 1959. Anyway, so I was there at school for six months and then I went home because they ran out of money. And they had a program called Anti-Poverty. And this is where they're fixing up roads and filling potholes and all the rest of it. So I got a job, and I think we got paid a uh, dollar and 90 cents an hour. And we worked nine hours a day and six days a week, but there was no taxes taken out. And I was sent with these old guys. They were all about their 50s at least down to the sandbar where they'd load, they'd load gravel from the beach onto this truck with shovels. So I went down there and young and full of energy. I took that shovel and boy, I was just doing this. The next day I was kind of walking <laughs> and those old guys were back at it. So I watched them for a while. And then, so I started copying them. What they do is they take the handle of the shovel and put it against the hip here, put it in the ground, and push their body forward, lift, rock back, and throw it. Like that. So I start copying them, they start laughing, and say, oh, he can learn. <laughs> <laughs> so you, know, you learn how to use your muscles rather than you know, in a little different way. Uh, let's see, last time I fell out of the tree, <laughs> I haven't climbed any in a while. Apple my fingernails are too short. Apple picking is fun, right? No, my fingernails are too short. So yeah, it's, um, when they talk about this climate change, I was listening to a program this morning, this woman was talking about living in downtown east side where she raises bees. And she said she gets better honey from those bees 
on the downtown east side because of these are very adept at finding blossoms and stuff all over the place and not just junk. And she was talking about how how healing bees are. That if one lands on you, you can feel vibrating. And when you're in a hive too, there's a vibration where everybody's humming the same tune with a different voice. And she talked about sometimes you get stung, it hurts. But when a bee stings her, she says thank you because it is... Uh, made the ultimate sacrifice in protecting the other, it dies after it stings you. And she said sometimes you might put your hand in the wrong place and touch where the young ones are, and one of the caretakers will sting you, but their sting isn't very bad because they're focused on feeding these, these young ones. But the ones that are the protectors, now that one really carries a punch. So she was talking about all that, about how, and I remember reading an article about somewhere down in the States, they had a crazy situation where the bees, the, some of the honey was uh, blue, some of it was red, and some were yellow. And they couldn't figure out what the heck is going on, so they started searching, finding what kind of plants. And what it was, was a truck had crashed, and it had a whole bunch of M&M's on there. And they were getting a sugar from those M&M's. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what the article said. Yeah. I hope it was true. <laughs> I get designer honey. <laughs> but also honey has, is uh, antibacterial. It kills bacteria. Uh, so anyway, physical fitness and also Paying attention to your surroundings, where am I? With these GPS things uh, and riding the bus, people don't look out. It's just they're all focused on something else. And so the whole world goes up. I used to go down to Granville Island to, uh, when I first got a laptop, and that's where I did a lot of my writing. And I'd look out, and one day I seen this great big swan swimming by there at Granville Island, on the other side of the town. And nobody even noticed. You know, here's this great big swan just paddling away. Another time there were porpoise in there, and nobody noticed. You see seals, I haven't seen a seal in there in a long time, but seals would come up and nobody even noticed. Unless I'd say, hey, look at that seal. Oh, what? Is that what that is? They didn't notice the ducks, they didn't notice anything. And one of the my one of the problems I have with in working with the families here is that so many of them come from the prairies, and so to them a body of water is just a body of water, it's like a lake. They don't realize there's a whole ocean out there. They don't even know that some of the ocean is salty. They've never tasted. They don't know there's all these beings living underneath that water. They don't know there's things under the rocks. Many of the native people. Because nobody's ever told them. Nobody's ever taken them and shown them. And if you come from the prairies, you don't really have a whole lot of water, bodies of water. I remember when a delegation from Saskatchewan flew out to uh, Hyde Y. They were just amazed that there was so much water in the world. And they'd never seen that much water. Okay, the Great Lakes are look like an ocean, but out here, you know, it's just 90 miles just from Rupert out there. So, so you have to start paying attention. And one of the things that we're going to put on there is what these old men talked about, about the trees, how you're supposed to treat them. And uh, so I'll put that on Facebook too. Because this old man said, if you go like 20 when you're 20, you'll be damn lucky to go like 60 when you're 60. <laughs> but if you go like 60 when you're 20, you know, 60 miles an hour, it doesn't mean driving. 
Um, and also pay attention to the smell of the plants with the um, with the pines, with the needles. If you're going through the woods and you start to get tired, just grab a bunch of pine needles and you know, bunch of and then twist them so that it crushes the, and and the, the juice and you can get the scent from it. And then just sniff that pine scent and that'll give you energy. It isn't for very long, maybe an hour, but it's enough to sometimes give you a little pick up. Uh, Uh, I was watching the news and the fish going up to Alaska, the water, ocean is warming up and they're not making it up to the, to the spawning grounds. Yeah, the salmon up there and catch my bait are thousands of dead salmon because the water's too warm. And uh, <clears throat> that governor up there, <clears throat> somebody ought to tell him to go back where he came from. He came from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> And they're taking out all the environmental protections. That's they're going to permit mining. They're opening up the uh, national monument areas for development. Well, we're, yeah, we're losing everything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because, like, it never means they're letting them dig for razor farms again back home. Uh, and they beach and all that because, um, what is it? For the, uh, since Fukushima, we've had radiation. And then over time, as you consume it, you don't need to consume it every day, but as long as your body has the consumption, the radiation is positive within the body, then cancers develop. Uh -huh. But now they're saying, they just lifted the ban like a week ago, two weeks ago, saying that they can um, dig for clams, razor clams. But then there's radiation in the ground. Radiation stays in the ground. It doesn't go away one day. It's like uh, you know, radiation is going to keep coming in all. Yeah, see their filter, their filter feeders, so everything <coughs> concentrates, and it's the same with your fish. But the lava, the lava rock absorbs radiation, but there's no our foods are getting contaminated. Yeah. Our fish are getting smaller. Yeah. Um, the Thank you. 